If you've got your Bibles this morning, would you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter. We're going to read two scriptures, in fact, and I'm reading from the NIV. The second scripture is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. So Matthew's gospel is going to be pop up. It's going to pop up on the screen. It's very important that you come to church with a Bible, a, a phone, or something to take notes, a notepad, an iPad, your pad. I I I love taking notes. Um, it's great. I, I always believe the Chinese proverbs that says a short pen is better than a long memory. And so I take that to heart. So I, I take a lot of notes when I hear speakers speak, and I pray you do the same with me. It's great also to hold me accountable. Everybody say, hold the pastor accountable. Everybody say, hold the pastor accountable. Yeah, you can come back to me and say, hey, you said this. It's important that you do that. We're not afraid of it because we're pre preaching to you truth. Amen? Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter, for those of you watching online, if you have a Bible, it'll be awesome if you can open that Bible. I don't think our, our screen tags are working yet. Uh, by next week, we should have that up. Um, so if you have a Bible at home, please uh, get the Bible and follow along with us, or trust me as I read the Word of God. That's a big ask. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Here's what it says, the NIV version. It says, watch out for false prophets. I could stop there and, pre and, and preach. Watch out for storms. Watch out for the enemy. It, it's a big, big shout out. They, they come to you in sheep, sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious, ravenous wolves. My God, they are disguised. You're not, you have to watch out for them, but they're going to look like a sheep. You, you won't be able to see them with your eyes, but you're to watch out with them, for them. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1, look at this. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers amongst you. Not your neighbor and said, I hope that's not you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, false teachings, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. So this is kind of tricky because they think that they are doing evil and they're going to get away with it. <laughs> but the Bible says you ain't going to, you ain't going to get away. The Bible says you're going to, you're going to bring swish, swift destruction on yourself. So when you decide to be a false prophet, expect destruction. Now let me tell you a little story. I was born in Guyana, South America. And when I was a young child, there was a man that came to my country by the name of Jim Jones. Jim Jones was a very interesting character. He was an American preacher that belonged to the organization, the Independent Assemblies of God. He was a believer like us, just like you. He believed in things like salvation through grace. He believed in miracles. He believed in signs and wonders. In fact, when he was with that organization, it was a great preacher by the name of William Branham that sanctioned him. And actually spoke well about him. Jones pretty much started like most of us. Jones later went on and he founded his own organization that would become known as the People's Temple in Indianapolis. However, someplace along the line, he got himself involved in politics and eventually to adjust to his newfound love, he began to become skeptical of the Bible. He began to misinterpret the Bible, misread the Bible. He started good, 
but he began to twist scriptures to fit his worldview. He had an opinion of what politics should be like. And so what he did, he went to the Bible and he took the Bible to fit his view instead of taking the Bible to change his view or to teach him. You know, preachers do that. We want to tell you something, we take the scriptures and we twist it so that we can justify ourselves. And that's what Jones began doing. He began to reject the traditional views of the organization that he once came from, the Assemblies of God. And of course, he began to reject the claims of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He in fact believed that Jesus came to bring the message of socialism. He believed that Jesus came to bring a one world government called the kingdom of God. And his theory was that the kingdom of God was a socialist government on the earth. And so with this mindset at heart, he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He believed that Jesus was a type of the Messiah, but the real Messiah was himself. And that he were to raise up followers and he were to uh, bring about a revolution of socialism in America. This was his mission. He was to be the one that would bring salvation then to America or to the world. Wow. He encouraged his people to become somewhat of a revolutionist. He told them, we have to start a revolution of socialism in America. After a while, of course, following a period of negative media attention and some reports of abuse taking place at People's Temple, Jones got a bit perturbed and he started construction in 1974 in my country, Guyana, in an area, someplace in the bush. And he started this community or commune called Jonestown. Eventually, he compelled his people that they needed to follow him to go to Jonestown, and many did. Over 900 folks went with him from the U.S. to Jonestown. Now, Jones told them that he was creating a social community that would be a paradise that they can escape from the tyranny of the American government. We need to go and live by ourselves. He was welcomed in my country. At that time, we had a president by the name of Forbes Burnham. Mr. Forbes Burnham was a socialist himself. He created his own form of socialism. And so it was easy for Jones to assimilate because he was going to a country that already believed in socialism. He was welcomed with open arms in my country because one socialist government invited another socialist activist. Come on, build your community in our bush. By 1978, reports surfaced that there were some human rights violation and abuse. There were some accusations that people were being held in Jonestown against their will. So what the US government did is they sent some representatives to go and find out if this if these reports are true, and to find those individuals in the camp that filed the report. And as the representative went to Jonestown, and they found the two individuals that filed the complaint, they were leaving sometime in November of 1978. They were leaving when two or, or, or three of Jones' armed guards shot them and killed them dead. Four people were shot dead in that raid. Eventually what happened is that Jones convinced his over 909 members, 304 of those were children, he convinced them all that it is better for them to drink, to drink flavored aid or Kool-Aid laced with cyanide and he killed every single one of them. If you've ever heard the term, don't drink the Kool-Aid, it came from this massacre 
from my country. My point I want to make this morning is this. With this story is Jones, Jim Jones, was a false prophet in sheep clothing. He started out professing Christ. He was an excellent speaker. He was charismatic. He knows how to draw people's attention. He was convincing. He had more people than I have here in my church following him. Nine hundred and nine people lost their lives because this man deceived them. This wolf in sheep clothing. Because they followed charisma rather than truth. Isn't that funny how today what sells is charisma? You turn on the TV. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. For what? For what? Get ready for what? But when you have a preacher that stands up and preaches the word of God, oh, oh, he's not a good preacher. No, no, you're not a good listener. Why don't we twist that around a little bit? We're preaching the word of God to you. You just don't want to hear the word of God because it's going to mess your little dream up. Y'all hearing me? Hosea the prophet said this in Hosea 4, 6. People are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Hmm. You see, the problem with false prophets is not new. It's not new to us, and as the scripture says, it was not new to the church. There were many false prophets among the people in the early church. However, one of the things we are told in scripture is that false prophets will increase in number. False teachers will increase in numbers. In fact, we are told that people will have itching ears and follow them. We, we, how will this increase happen? People will begin to believe themselves more than they believe the word of God and speak from their emotions instead of speaking truth. It's crazy what's happening. It's crazy. So there will be an increase as we head towards the rapture of false prophets. Satan's got to take a last grab. Hit and run. <laughs> Smash and grab. He's got to take a run at you. And one of the ways he's going to do that is by sending deceiving voices to convince you that you don't need to be in church, number one. <laughs> you don't need the church. <laughs> That's a new popular thing that we're hearing now. Yet the scripture says in Hebrew, forsake not the gathering of yourselves. Where? At church. At church. Completely di disregarding scripture. I love it when I see it because I'm like, oh my goodness. They don't even know they're being deceived. There's nothing you can really say to people these days. Because as soon as you open your mouth and tell them truth, they're ready to fight you. Because they'd rather live in their lie. It's amazing how this works. You can't correct people anymore in churches. Anytime you correct somebody in church, you know what happens? They get offended. And they're ready to leave the church. Go ahead, leave the church. But let me tell you why this morning, why all these false prophets will raise up in the last days. The reason they will raise up is because of a prophecy, which is ironic. <laughs> a prophecy caused it. False prophets will raise up because of a prophecy. Let's go to it. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. Look what it says. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will. So there's a mass movement of prophecy that's going to take place in the end times. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So what happens here in the book of Acts is that the spirit of the Lord is poured out on the day of Pentecost. And Peter stands up to explain the event. And what he said in the chapter, is he said, this has been prophesied to you by Joel the prophet. That a day is coming, which is today, the day of Pentecost, where the Spirit will be poured out. And when the Spirit comes, many then will become prophets and visionaries. And many apparently will be sleeping because that's the only way you can have dreams. <laughs> 
and, and before I go any further, let me say this to you on this subject. I believe in the gift of prophecy. I believe in prophets. I believe in them. In fact, a prophet changed our lives. I believe that the gift of prophecy should be in the church. I believe the prophet should be in the church. We don't have a prophet here, I'm telling you, I don't have one. I'm not a prophet. <laughs> Can I say that again? You will never hear me call myself a prophet. I will never self-appoint. <laughs> so, so I believe I encourage the gift of prophecy. In fact, I have a course here that I teach on prophecy and how to activate prophecy. I believe that all of God's people should prophesy and in fact, I would love all of you to prophesy. I don't believe, and here's what I don't believe. I don't believe everybody is called to be a prophet. But I believe everybody is called to prophesy. Listen to me carefully. I do not believe everybody is called to be a prophet. But I believe everybody is called to be, to prophesy. The same way I don't believe everybody's called a pastor, but I believe everybody's called to preach. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. But not because you can preach, you are a pastor. And not because you can prophesy, you are a prophet. Oh boy. Can I show you an example? Can you put a clock up for me, please? Let me show you an example, Jeff. You're going to like this. What time is that? 10 past 10. 10, 10. It's my scripture. Do you know that a clock is right even if it doesn't have battery and it doesn't work, it's right twice a day? Did you guys know that? Do you know that you can speak and be right at least twice in your life? Do you know a false prophet can be right? Even a dead clock can be right twice a day, sir. So a, a false prophet can be right. They can actually give you a right prophecy and convince you that they are a prophet. This is the garbage of it. So I don't believe you're all called to be prophets. I, however, believe that everybody can prophesy just like this clock can tell the time twice a day right. You can all prophesy. Not your name. It says you can prophesy. Amen. Amen. The New Testament, the prophet of the New Testament operates different than the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. The prophet of the New Testament belongs to what we call the five-four ministry found in Ephesians. And the gift belongs to every believer. You all should prophesy. That means any believer can prophesy. In any church, you can prophesy. So when you see somebody prophesying, don't be amazed by it. You can do the same. I said, amen. Don't be fascinated by prophecy. Thank God for it. But you're not a prophet because you can prophesy. There's a lot of people now these days that are self-appointing them. Appointing and they're calling themselves prophet because they're like the clock. They're right twice a day. So because you're right, all of a sudden you're a prophet. And some of us are so stupid because people tell us something, they must be a prophet because they told us right. So we're even dumb. Forget about the lying prophet that's right. <laughs> we're even stupid as hell. Because somebody can tell you twice in, your, in a day. You come to the altar and somebody give you two accurate prophecy. Does that make them a prophet? <laughs> How many of you have ever wore a dead watch to show off? I'll leave it there. <laughs> Your watch has no battery, but you just like the bling. You know what I mean? Okay, I've done it. I'm guilty. <laughs> you have to hear my heart this morning. Because we need to clear this mess up. To discourage the false prophet. To equip you to have proper discernment. We need to do it. Everybody said we need to get this done. 
Why? Because we're in the last days and there will be many false prophets. So I, as a pastor, I need to prepare you, the sheep, how to handle this matter properly. A prophet is a person who has heard the call of God, not a person that prophesies. I became a pastor not because of my education, because I certainly didn't have good abilities to read and write. I became a pastor of this church not because I was an eloquent speaker, I was highly educated, I had money. No, I became a pastor because I heard the call of God. Can I say that again? I heard the call of God. God actually showed up to me and said, son, I need you to plant a church. He spoke to me. He called me. Not because, you know, these days young people go to Bible school and because they went to Bible school, now you're a pastor. So let me ask you this stupid question. Because you live in a garage, your car? Okay, I'll leave that there. You'll get that tomorrow. <laughs> It's silly how this works. We have a whole bunch of kids that are going to Bible school and all of a sudden they take up the office of a pastor and destroys the church because they were never called. They even commit suicide and kill people and rape children because they were never called. They get a little problem, they pull out a gun and start shooting you. My God. If you call yourself a prophet this morning because you can prophesy, I want to tell you, you have proper lied. <laughs> You've lied. And if you believe somebody is a prophet because they can prophesy, you're as dumb as that clock. You don't know the difference between a prophet and prophecy. Don't be confused with prophecy and a prophet. Because how many people can prophesy? Everybody. Moses says, I wish that all of God's people would prophesy. Uh, the text says in Acts chapter 2 that everybody that will, the Holy Ghost will come upon will prophesy. How many of you here are filled with the Holy Ghost? Let me see your hands. You all can look around. How many people here can prophesy? Everyone that is filled with the Holy Ghost can prophesy. We need to settle this doctrine and how this thing works. So that you don't get confused with the gift of prophecy versus the prophet who must be called of God. Amen, everybody. Jump over to 1 Thessalonians 5 for me a minute. Let me show you what it says. And I love this text. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 says this. It says, do not quench the spirit. Everybody said, don't shut the Holy Ghost down. And then it says, do not despise prophecy. Don't, don't just... Shut prophecy out. I'll tell you why in a minute. Let it flow. Everybody say, let it flow. <laughs> now look at verse 21. But test them all. So it says, let the prophecy flow, but test it. Don't, don't kill the person who's speaking. You must be a false prophet. <laughs> no, no, let them prophesy. Hey, hey you're going to buy a car soon. Wow, I just felt that was real though. And he's looking at me like it's real. <laughs> Is it real? <laughs> My money or your money? I'm just saying. <laughs> My thanks. <laughs> it says test, test them all and hold on to what is good. Test them all and hold on to what is good. So the writer here encourages prophecy but he says, test it. Make sure. The word test there means make sure it's from God. Everybody say, make sure it's from God. Because prophets and people can speak out of their emotions. And they can be right. I can tell you things that I just randomly made up, and they'll be right at least twice a day. You know what? You're in pain. You look like you're in pain. Wow, how did I know that? <laughs> How many of you here have some type of pain? Most people do. <laughs> if it ain't your knee, it ain't your shoulder, it ain't your heart, it ain't your mouth, something's hurting. So it sounds good. We can go up to people, and let me show you. I can go up to people and say, you know, you're looking like you just had a rough life. 
I wonder what I gave that. Must be the curls, Samson. <laughs> Did I call him Samson? <laughs> What's up with you and Samson, by the way? <laughs> So, so don't, don't, listen, my point is don't get confused with somebody just prophesying to you. Receive it. And then the Bible says test it. Make sure it's from God. Look at 1 John 4, 1, 1 and 2. Let me show you. I'm giving you a few things here because I need you to grasp it. Dear friends, that's you. Do not believe every spirit. But do what? Test the spirit to see whether they are of God. And because of what? Many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we're called to test the prophecy. Good. Basically, the text is saying this morning, don't accept prophets or prophecy without putting them through a test. Do you have a test for prophecy? Most don't. Most don't have a test, and that's unfortunate. Because it tells you the test, but you don't have a test. I mean, if you want, the COVID had a test, and how many of you had packages that came home? <laughs> but you're a Christian, and you don't have a test for prophecy, yet it tells you. But you, that means you're gullible. That means you've been duped, and you don't even know it yet. Because you don't have a test. In fact, in fact my wife could give me a false prophecy. Don't. Your BFF can give you a false prophecy. I could give you a false prophecy. You should be able to test it. Because there are many false prophecies that have gone out into the world. So the, the, the scripture is actually encouraging you to have a test. A way of validating words. A way of signifying or identifying a false prophet. The scriptures are encouraging that. Now, why is the test there? Why, why would God put it, say, test it? It's easy. Because prophecy has great value and great influence. Write it down. Prophecy has great value and great influence. And if it has such value, and if it can influence you in such a way, it needs to be tested, or else you could be heading in the wrong direction. Because of the value of money, for those of you that have been in banking, bankers have a counterfeit test. So this is what we call a counterfeit test in the Bible. The Bible actually tells us to develop a counterfeit test. And what your bank does is because of the value of money. They never take large bills, Pastor Thomas. They never take large bills. And if, they, if you go to a teller and you give them a large bill, $100, $50 or something of a, of a sort, they would take it and they would actually try to rub it on some paper to see if the ink is dry. Or they would take a pen and they would test it to make sure it's authentic. Or they put it under a blue light. Most bankers are sharp. They can feel it in their fingers. But I'm not that guy. <laughs> I need a pen. <laughs> I need a test. So because of the value of money, even banks have counterfeit. The question is, why hasn't the church developed a test? Because we don't understand the value of prophecy. We don't understand the power of prophecy. We don't understand how great and, and, and influential prophecy can be in your life. It's a powerful gift. You should all have it. So what is the value of prophecy? What is the influence of prophecy? Number one, the prophetic releases the kingdom of God. Wow! The prophetic does what? When God wants to advance a certain part of his kingdom, he prophesies it. Like he wanted to advance the move of the Holy Spirit, Joel prophesied that it was coming. When God wants to advance your life, he will prophesy it. Every prophetic word has an assignment on it. It releases the kingdom of God. And when a prophetic word comes forth, it comes back by all of heaven's resources. My God, 
If the prophetic word is genuinely from God, ladies and gentlemen, it has the power to deliver you. It has the power to heal you. It has the power to bless you. It has the power to transform you. It has the power to bring you into a new life. It has the power to free you in the very moment it is released. Wow. It's powerful. Every prophetic word has an assignment. When a prophetic word was released by Gabriel to Mary, oh my goodness, it released the kingdom of God inside of her. What does the prophetic word do? It releases the kingdom of God. So when I prophesy to you, I will release the kingdom of God for your life. That's why it's so powerful. Check this out. Isaiah, Gabriel, Isaiah 7, 4, 14. Gabriel comes to Mary and he prophesies a prophecy. He comes to her and he tells her this. He says, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, Mary, that's you, your virgin, right? Let me check. He prophesies Isaiah 7, 14 to Mary. He says, Mary, let me tell you what's going to happen. It's been written about you hundreds of years before that you, the virgin, you are a virgin, that you're going to have a child. You're going to bear a son. And he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. You're going to carry the very kingdom of God inside of you. That's what prophecy does. Prophecy brings the kingdom of God to you. Everybody say, prophecy brings the kingdom of God to me. Lift your hands again and say, Lord, bring the kingdom to me. Yes. That's what prophecy does. It brings the kingdom of God to you. Now, there's another side to the prophetic. The prophetic also reveals the future. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 28. A prophet by the name of Agabus stood up and through the Holy Spirit predicts a severe famine that was spread over the entire Roman world. And it did. It happened during the reign of Claudius. So the prophet, check this out. When, when, when a person is really speaking in the prophetic, they foretell. Everybody say foretell. Not fortune tell. <laughs> they do what? They foretell. They can tell the future. They can tell you things that is coming in the future. That's the value. Foretelling is an act of foreseeing. Everybody say foretelling is an act of foreseeing the future and speaking it. It's, it's not... It's not speaking the future. You have to see it before you speak. You are foretelling. You're going to see the future and you're going to see and you're going to speak it. Now there's another thing that happens. Prophets can also call the future into existence. What? Yeah. The one thing I love about the prophetic word, it's creative. Everybody said prophetic words are creative. creative. Prophetic words are what? Creative. So this is called foretelling. F-O-R-T-H. T-L-L-I-N-G. Foretelling. When, when, when a prophet is operating in this gift, you can cause things to happen by prophesying them into being. The scripture says, call those things which be not as though they are. So we can prophesy it into your life. We don't have to see it. We can prophesy it into your life. So you can prophesy health. That's why I was prophesying over you health. Because I can prophesy. I have the power to prophesy. Because the Holy Ghost is in me. I can prophesy. I, come, I prophesy that you will be a healthy woman in 30 days. We can prophesy health. Hey guys, you can prophesy wealth. Who here wants some wealth? Why aren't all your hands going up? Shame on you. <laughs> you, can, you can prophesy. You can prophesy things into people's life. You can prophesy health. You can prophesy change. We, you know, sometimes you don't have to pray for your husband. Just prophesy. I prophesy that you will be saved in 10 days. In fact, why don't you just get saved now? You can, pro a genuine prophetic person can prophesy things into existence. You guys remember Ezekiel 37? You know what happened in Ezekiel 37? Ezekiel, God takes Ezekiel and he shows him a valley of dry bones. And you know what he says? He says, Ezekiel, what do you see? He said, Lord, I just see a bunch of dry bones. 
He says, okay, okay, then Ezekiel can prophesy over it. So Ezekiel began to prophesy, dry bones, you shall live. And all of a sudden, sinew start to come back on the dry bones, flesh and nerves and veins and blood. You can prophesy things into being. Ezekiel called dry bones to come alive. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the value of prophecy. No wonder Satan wants to counterfeit it. I said, no wonder Satan wants to counterfeit it. Because if it is so powerful, if it can bring the kingdom of God to you, if it can tell you the future, and if it can prophesy things into your life, do you know how powerful that is? That's why the apostle writes, test to make sure it's the right spirit. Test to make sure that someone is not leading you in the wrong direction. Somebody can come and they can say, oh, I think you should marry Jeanette. I hope you don't know anybody Jeanette because it's not a prophecy. <laughs> That's your aunt's name. Do not marry your aunt. Okay? And they can prophesy to you. But and all of a sudden, you know that girl don't like you. And then all of a sudden, you start stripping yourself down so she can like you. Mis a prophet can mislead you. So you need, you need to test every person that speaks into your life. You need to test it because the prophetic is so powerful. It, it gives you direction. What does it do? It directs your life. I had a prophecy. My wife and I had a prophecy when we, when we were much younger. A Young, little younger. And, and we were poor as the mouse in the church and we don't have any here. Nobody look at your feet. <laughs> And, and, and I was going to get a job. And I had my resumes ready because I w nobody was calling me to preach. And I was home. And uh, we, went, we went to Ikea. We usually do that. We would go to Ikea and just walk around and eat ice cream. It's pretty cheap. It's a dollar. <laughs> and we just walk around and look at all the nice things we could own and we could have. And we would dream. And while I was walking in Ikea, I saw this big guy. And I'm like, Chris. Do you know that guy? She goes, nope. <laughs> I said, that, that guy looks like my prison guard. And he was working at Ikea. So I said, you know, would you come? Let's go talk to him. So I walked up to the big burly guy and I said, hey, is your name Dawkins? He goes, I remember you. I said, bro, I remember you. You were so good to me when I was in jail. And he hugged me. Of course, you know it hurt. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and, and then he said, he said to me, he said, what are you doing now with your life? I said, man, I'm a preacher. He started to jump in the middle of Ikea. And he said, man, I'm so happy for you. Listen, I go to this amazing church. What are you doing on Sunday? I said, nothing. We'd already agree we won't go to church on Sunday. Because remember, I was praying, and God told me not to go to church on Sunday. You're going someplace else. God told me that we didn't know where. We meet Dawkins. He invites me to his church. Now, I'm sitting. I'm sitting. This amazing story. I'm sitting. I'm going to try to bring this gal. Trust me. I'm sitting in, in, in where Debor is, and the pastor and his wife is sitting. Actually, Debor, I was sitting here. Christine was sitting there. And this woman is sitting beside me. And while they're worshiping, she's like this. And all of a sudden, she just gets up in the middle of the worship service, grabs the mic from the worship leader, and she looks at me, and she says, you! What? She says, you! God said, you shall not work. Now, you got to remember, I got my resumes ready to go out on Monday morning. 20 of them. How, how does she know that? He says, you shall not work. God says, I'm going to give your wife a new job, and she's going to have twice as much salary, and you will do ministry for me. Do not work, says the Lord. And I am. Christine looks at me, and she says, that's what the prophet says. Somehow we knew, you know, because I knew Dawkins, and I knew his heart. But we took that prophecy. We believed it. And exactly what God said, Christine got this job. She got twice as much. I stayed home, and I prepared myself for ministry, and I went traveling the world. The prophetic gift will leave, give you direction. Everybody said the prophetic gift will give you direction. So you must test it, because if you don't test it, and if it isn't from God, you're going to be led astray. You're going to be led in the wrong direction. 
They can mislead you. They can misguide you. They can send you chasing things that God never spoke. They can send you believing for things that God never said you should have. They can mis mislead you to marry the wrong person, the daughter of Satan. I'm just saying. <laughs> they can make you invest in the wrong stocks and bonds and, and in the wrong things in life and waste your time. And some of you went to university and you know you shouldn't have. I don't know why that came out, but I'm just saying it. I'm trying to be a prophet today, Brandon. Thank you. <laughs> and let me say this. The prophetic word doesn't automatically happen. Write it down. It doesn't automatically happen. It's not based on God's sovereignty. God said it, and that's it. Not the prophetic. His words in the Bible, yes. But not the prophetic. Some people believe once they hear the prophetic word, that settles it. No, it doesn't work that way. Everybody say the just shall live by faith. Every prophecy spoken over you must be believed for to come to pass. Must be what? Believe for to come to pass. Let me say this. Many people don't understand the difference between prophecy and word of knowledge. Now here I have the gift of word of knowledge and it's exclusive. It's crazy. It, it'll, it'll show me things that will blow your mind away for some of you that it has shown me. The word of knowledge, what is the word of knowledge? The word of knowledge is supernatural revelation of information given to a person. Say supernatural revelation of information. Prophecy, on the other hand, I told you, brings the kingdom. It speaks of the future and it calls the future. But the word of knowledge is about the past and the present. What is it about? But prophecy is about the future. So God separates these gifts in scripture. Word of knowledge is about, I can see your past. I can know what's happening in your life now. But prophecy is all about the future. It's about disclosing the future and future events so you can have a breakthrough. There's a difference. Let me tell you about a word of knowledge I once had, Chan. So Pastor Tony and Chan, they have this amazing friends that they love dearly that would come and hang out with them. And so one day they had invited their friend over and they so happened to call us and say to us, Asif and Christine, why don't you come over and meet our friends? And so we had gone over and we were sitting in their, in their quaint little uh, living room and we were having a discussion and all of a sudden the gentleman jumps up and he starts to say, my son has been missing for over one year. We've been recently speaking to a coroner and some other people and getting advice. And they said to us that after one year, you should say that the son is dead. They were ready to write off the son as dead. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching the tears and the shivering of the woman. And, and, and you know, and they were so broken that I'll never forget that afternoon. It was a summer afternoon. And they were broken and I'm sitting there and I'm like this. God, what do I do? And all of a sudden, I get a word of knowledge, not a prophecy. I get a word of knowledge, not a prophecy, Chan. A word of knowledge. And here's what the word of knowledge said to me. Tell him, in three weeks, <laughs> you're, you're going to hear from your son. Now, you got to hear me. They haven't heard from their son in one year. They're about to pronounce him dead. And I just got a word from the Holy Ghost that says, tell him in three weeks. So I looked at the fella and I said, in three weeks, you're going to hear from your son. And all of a sudden, I see Chan comes out with a kettle in the kitchen. <laughs> what did you say? Uh, I was scared of her. <laughs> she said, I said, in three weeks, you're going to see the kid. She goes, but Asif, are you sure? Remember you asking me? She said, Asif, are you sure? And I looked to turn the face. I said, I am 100% sure God just spoke that into my spirit. The conversation went silent. The family didn't know what to do. In nine days, in nine days, the police in Arizona calls this man and says, Sir, we just found the ID of your son. He's shacked up in a trailer. Come and get him. In nine days of me giving that word of knowledge. Nine days. I can tell you stories after stories of people. I give this girl here, over here. He, uh, she just come from the doctor. The doctor says, you cannot have a child. 
the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm preaching and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost comes upon me. The Holy Ghost says, I didn't know she just came from the doctor. You never told me. I looked at her and I said, God said you shall have a son. And he's in Sunday school. <laughs> she was scared, but God gave me a word of knowledge. The gift is phenomenal. Not the future. I know. God showed it to me what was happening in the present. Immediately, I knew that boy was alive. I could see him alive when I prophesied those words. It's a tremendous gift to have words of knowledge and prophecy. There's nothing like it in the world. You should all lift your hands and say, Lord, I want gifts. Come on, lift your hands and say, Lord, I want some gifts. You must have gifts. The church must be filled with gifts. Oh, my God. I love gifts. I love gifts. God revealed to that family the status of their son through the word of knowledge. Wow, I'm almost done. There's only one exception to prophecy. There's only one exception to prophecy, and that is end time prophecy. Everybody say end time prophecy. End time prophecy are sovereign prophecies. Say with me, end time prophecies are sovereign prophecies. So when you get a prophecy, they're not sovereign. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You have to apply your faith to them. So if I come to Pastor Tony and I said to you, Pastor Tony, God showed me that in 30 days, this, 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 and this is going to happen. If you know me, and I'll tell you in a minute how to validate the prophet. If you know me enough and you can validate my gift and you receive that prophecy, you got to do three things. Everybody say, I got to do three things. Number one. You got to believe it by faith. Say, believe it by faith. Number two, you have to fight for it. Sometimes you, your, your brain says, ah, that's never going to happen. But you have to fight your brain and say, you're a liar. That's God's word. That's God's prophet. You're a liar. You look at it, you lying self. <laughs> and number, number three, you got to pray for it to come to move from conception to completion. Write it down. From conception, so the moment it was speak, spoken to you, you need to pray for it so that you say, God, I believe that prophet, and, 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 and whatever they say, I'm going to pray until I see it come to pass. You're not asking for it. You're declaring it will happen. Everybody say amen. So, so getting back to sovereignty. Prophecies are not sovereign. There's only one set of prophecy that are sovereign that must happen. Those are end time prophecies. And end time prophecies, nobody can change them. If, if the Bible says there's going to be earthquake, come in. If the Bible says there's going to be weird weather, trust me, Dubai can testify. If the Bible says there's going to be famine, trust me, they're going to be famine. You can't change it. You can pray, you can fast, you can believe, you can. So when it comes to end time prophecies, I don't pray. Let me teach you something. You know, there's some people, they're so silly. Oh, I'm praying, I'm praying that Israel won't go to war. No, I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem. That's what it told me to pray for. It didn't say don't pray for war. Because my Bible also told me that one of the end time prophecy is that Jesus is going to use Israel and they're going to whoop behind. <laughs> so I'm not praying for Israel not to fight. I'm praying for them to survive. So I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm praying exactly what Jesus said because I cannot, you cannot change end time prophecy. Do not pray to change an end time prophecy. Pray that God would use you in the end times. That's what you should pray. So there's only one set of prophecies that cannot be changed. End time prophecies. When you read it in the Bible, take it to the bank and cash it in. It's absolute. It will never change. But anytime you get a prophecy from a prophet, Test it. Let me give you one test. Next week I'll, I'll talk about more things. I have a lot of scriptures I want to show you. Let me give you one test of how I test a prophet. Me and my wife. One test. So, I never, we never receive a prophetic word without there being a high level of trust. Trust is like your marriage. You have to know somebody to trust them. So for us, we have to know you. We have to make sure that we know you. 
You, there are many people that come and prophesy to us, prophesy all kind of nonsense. We've heard all kind of junk. But we don't even know them. So I never even bother waste my time. Because God will never send me an unknown prophet. <laughs> he knows that. That's my desire. I said, Lord, you told me to test them. And one of the tests is never send me an unknown prophet. God will never send me an unknown. Never. He'll never send me some guy from Africa named Lovely. Oh boy, did I just press the wrong button? You know why I don't listen to those fools? Because they're not my prophet. <laughs> did you know that Israel had their own prophet? Everybody knew who Samuel was. Everybody! And when Samuel showed up, everybody shivered. You have to have your own prophet. Everybody said, I need my own prophet. And you must know the prophet. You must know him that he's not profiting from you. <laughs> you, everybody said, you must know your prophet. If not, you're going to pay. <laughs> So we, we never receive words from anybody. No, no one in the congregation that we don't trust. We never take their words. There are many people that prophesy to me that I do believe here. I know them very well. For example, Quran has come to me and said to me many prophecies. And they've been accurate to me. And I thank God for that Quran. I, I want to say thank you. I have people here who, who, do, who use the gift of prophecy. Quran's not a prophet. He's a photographer. I know you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you take pictures of prophets. <laughs> but Quran has a gift. He, he uses the gift of prophecy and he's been quite accurate with me. He may not be accurate with you. You need to test him for yourself or get to know him for yourself. That's what I'm trying to say. Not because he's nice to me and he's accurate with me. He'll be accurate with you. You have to test him for yourself. So I never receive a word from anybody that is not personally known to us. That we have trusted Number two in that equation. In order for me to trust you, you must have the behavior that matches scripture. <laughs> Everybody say behavior that matches scripture. You can't be a liar. You can't be attacking my wife or attacking my children and come tell me, but you give me a word from God. After you don't cuss me out, you, you, you cuss out the woman I love and you're gonna say, but you, I'm gonna receive. You, you gotta be an idiot to think you can cuss out my bride and then try to give me a prophecy. Are you sick? Do you want a lash? <laughs> so this is the stupidity of it. I never receive a word from anybody that attacks my family or attacks my church. <laughs> Did anybody that attacks my family, that's personal 101. And anybody that attacks my church, which I'm representing here for Jesus Christ, you're not allowed to prophesy ever go home <laughs> take a nap so I never listen to people that criticize attacks because how can you give me a prophecy that God's going to bless me when me and my wife God told me we're one even if let's just say she's not a good wife she's a great wife let's just say she's not a great good wife God still made me one so you can't prophesy to me and condemn my wife you're a false prophet Right off the top, you're false. You, you cussing out my wife, cussing out my, my wife's, my, me, my, her husband, me. <laughs> and then you're going to prophesy to my wife, you're sick, you're drunk, you need help. You're deceived, you've lied to yourself, you're a false prophet. That alone. So number one, never, never pro take prophecy from anybody that you don't trust. Number two, never take prophecy from anybody who is critical who condemns you or your ministry or your church or your family. They may speak well of you, but they may speak bad of your children. Don't ever take a prophecy from that person. Here, write this down. Never receive a prophecy from the enemy. <laughs> write it down. It's ABCs, Don. ABCs. We have a rule here, and you're going to learn that in the class. We have a rule here. If you are at odds... If I'm at odds with Chen and she says, well, God, God gave me a word for you, but she and I are fighting. I'm sorry. She's not allowed by scripture to come and give me prophecy because she's prophesying out of her emotions. She already hates me. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, leave your gift at the altar. Go to your brother and make it right. Then come back and prophesy. That's the scriptures. You cannot prophesy to me and you are odds with me. You can't do that. Leave your gifts at the altar. 
your prophecy gift, your healing gift, your, your whatever gift. Your, uh, don't leave the, I mean, leave the money. <laughs> That's what the scripture means. It says, leave your gifts at the altar. Then go to your brother and make it right. Amen. And then go back, pick up the gifts, and then come back and prophesy. Amen. That's the right way to release a prophetic word. I will never release a prophetic word to any of you that I'm at odds with. In fact, I don't, I don't even pray for you. <laughs> You're wondering why you come to the altar and I probably don't touch you. You never see me come to you. Why don't I come? I sent Tony because I know you're gossiping about me. <laughs> what? You, you cannot. Write it down. Write this down. You can never receive from those you don't love. You can't. If you, if, if you come to the altar... If you come to the altar, come, Travis. You come to the altar for prayer and you're standing here. Now, I'm not saying because I passed you. I don't, you, know, you got, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> so don't read anybody I pass. Pastor doesn't like that person. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, please, please stop it, you gossipers. <laughs> if I pass you, Travis, not you. I, no, no. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so Travis comes to prayer, right? Comes to prayer. And I have the gift of healing, and I could pray for him. But him and I are at odds. I heard he was gossiping with Johnny about me. <laughs> and him and Johnny's like, yo, I don't know. The pastor's talking some garbage recently. And Johnny comes back and tell me, I'm not going to go to Travis and confront him with the garbage. I'm just not going to use my gift. Because he can't receive. He can never, even if I pray, he has odds with me. Even if I pray, it doesn't matter how hard I pray. He has criticism and things in his heart that he has against me. He cannot receive. So I want to tell you something. If, you have an, if you're at odds with me, don't come for prayer. Sit down. Go to Pastor Tony. <laughs> Go to Daniel. Go to Christine. Don't come to me. You're, you won't be, because you, you ever see magnets? Yeah, they, they, you, push each, you push away the gift. You can't receive from those you don't love. Write it down. You can't receive from those you don't love. You can't receive from those you gossip about. You can't receive from those you criticize. You can't receive from those you condemn. You can't, nobody can come in this church and receive be, and be on TV or whatever and condemn me. You can't receive. You'll come here. I, I, I can pray for you till the cow comes home. My gift won't work. Because you already have a blockage inside of you.